All right. Hey, everybody. Sorry we aren't uh, coming actually live today. Um, the new Facebook back end is acting up and we couldn't get it to connect. So, but here we are recording it. Uh, myself and Greg here for another episode of Paul and Greg. So today we're going to talk about bubbles. We've heard a lot about bubbles. If you haven't heard someone talk about a bubble, you might be living under a rock. Um, you know, everyone's kind of talking about it. it's being written about a lot. So we just wanted to talk to you guys about a few things. One, what is a bubble? What are our thoughts on a bubble? And how do we talk to the public about whatever whatever's going on right now? So, um, all right, Greg, um, so, you want to take the reins here for a second? Yeah, just it'll be this will be short. And then I think that you had some good questions there. And, you know, where you said, what do we associate with bubbles? You know, your little email you sent to me earlier today. Um, but what I just wanted to say to everybody was that the important thing to remember here is that none of us really know none of us possess the crystal ball. And so it's really a, a conversation that, you know, the public is going to look to you as the professional. Um, and sometimes we may want to provide an answer, but we have to be so careful because we really don't have an answer. We don't right. know what's going to happen, right? Right. Um, and then furthermore, couple other things to remember. They're going to be seeing things on the news. The word's going to be on the news. You're going to hear about it more and more. Um, but every market, we've always talked about this, that every market is unique and that there is not a national real estate market. There are local real estate markets and there are micro markets inside of the local markets. Um, so this conversation today is not meant to embellish, you know, with bizarre, large uh, titles such as um, the markets on a collision course with disaster. No, uh, I think well, I think it seems like a lot of people are pointing that it's the opposite of that, maybe. Well, and again, I guess it depends what you watch, what you read, because whatever you can find anything that you want. If you believe the market's going to is in a bubble, you're going to go find the information that supports that and vice versa. And so our job right now, I believe, as, bro as a brokerage, is to educate as best we can in a topic that's vast. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, a year ago, we were all living at this moment in a, in a world of uncertainty. None of us knew it was going to happen. No one could predict where this was going. And we ended up having six huge months of July through December. Um, today, the sales have been tracking. Um, obviously, um, Paul, you've got that chart that you wanted to talk about a little bit. I don't know if you want to bring yeah. that to this point, but why don't you? But go ahead. I think I think what what you're, I'm just going to repeat what I think I'm hearing is that you know, it's been a weird year, and and uh, obviously a very weird year, and and prices haven't slowed down in the face of a weird year. You used to make comments, um, you know, back in 2014, 15, when the market was still going like this, it's been going like this since about 2012, you would make comments like, you know, a couple things could slow this down. One, a major in interest rate increase to a, a major national emergency or, or worldwide emergency. Well, yeah. we went through one of those. Yeah. And it seemed that something different's happening here then. So I think we go from here before we jump into any graphs, is we have to talk just really briefly about bubbles and what a bubble is. So when we think of bubbles, we associate, first off, you associate popping, right? It's inflating like this, right? Maybe it's full of hot air, right? Um, and so we did see a bubble in 2008. So let's talk about that really quickly here. We did see a bubble in 2008, and I will show that graph right now. Um, uh, I'm going to um, see if I can share my screen here real quick. So let me load this up. Um, I'm going to show you a, a chart here. Um, here it is right here. So this is this right here, this graph, it's a little confusing. So I'm going to explain it to you real quick. So the, the light blue bars in the background, those are months inventory. And then you have the blue line uh, with the prices on it. That is the average sales price that we were seeing. Um, and again, I'm just using West Michigan right now, but this is, this is kind of, this kind of relates to the whole entire industry from coast to coast. 
And then I, what I've did is I've, I've used this box here to highlight um, 2002 through 2007. You can see starting in 2003 on the left there, we had a 5.5 month supply. Then I moved to a 6.2 month supply, then an eight month supply, then a 10 month supply in 2006. Okay. But, but look at that. Prices were rising right alongside of an increasing inventory. That goes against the, the, the general's principles of supply and demand. So how do you, in the world do you explain an increasing number of supply, meaning more options, less competition in the marketplace, and increasing prices? How do you explain that, Greg? Well, I didn't know you were asking me that, but I'll answer it. So <laughs> I, I believe that what we were seeing then, this was the... This was the hyped up market. This was the, the era of the, the big short. This was the era of liar's loans where somebody could go in and just state what their income was um, and the banks would have to take it face value. Um, the, the, so the, common, the common thought back then was you can't lose on real estate. Just buy as much as you can, hang on to it. The price always goes up. Right, and so we had we had uh, situations where people were buying way beyond what they could afford in hopes that they could flip it quickly and get back out. Um, we had people that would go buy a, a home for $200,000 that had been on the market for a year and they would pay 250 and then they would turn around and ask for $50,000 back in a finder's fee. So the buyer is walking away with a chunk of cash from the closing. And we're all scratching our heads going, why would anyone do this if they truly, do they really plan on paying these things back? Well, the answer was no. They were just, yep. it was a cash grab, right? Right. And so you had, you had inflation taking place. You had sales um, uh, increasing when in reality, it, it was not founded in sound economics. Well, you look at today yep. and I, can I move forward to today? Yeah, well, it's right here. You can see it. So you go, well, what? Okay, so, well, let, so let, let's, let's, let's just work through the chart real quick. So right. what we have highlighted here, that's an actual bubble. That was a superheated marketplace without sound economics going behind. The supply and demand ratios were broken. Prices were skyrocketing. And also there was no demand on the housing. It was just, there. look at the supply. We had eight to 10 months supply. Yeah. Then, you, then you move over here to 2007 through 2012. That's what we called the Great Recession. That was like the collapse. That's what happened after the bubble. That was the aftermath. Then we move into 2012. That's when it pretty much flipped in, in Michigan, where it started. we started seeing supply dropping and dropping and dropping and dropping. So now you see, when you move over here, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over here real quick and grab my little uh, highlighter here. So now you see this section here. Look what's happening to the... Um, to the supply and demand here. Now we have a supply and demand that looks to make a lot more sense. You have supply dropping, you have you have, and you have price increasing because of supply and demand. So so this area here is much more of what an economist would expect pricing to do when you don't have a lot of available housing. There's more demand for it. So the big question right now is what happens next? Because we can look use you can use hindsight as twenty twenty over here, and we can go okay. Well, we can see the previous recession. We can see the the bubble. We can see it pop. We saw what happened to pricing down here with an average sales price of one hundred and seven thousand dollars. And now fast forward to twenty twenty, which is one year beyond nineteen, and we're more like two eighty six. So take it from here, Greg. So I, interesting. I just saw the April numbers, and I think the April numbers showed the average sales price in Grar was at 297. And real quickly here, this is true for pretty much every association. Oh, yeah. We're just grabbing this one. Right. And then the other thing I want to flash back to is there in the middle, Paul, of your two boxes. Yeah, right here. Really, also what happens, that's a, that's a more normal response too, where when the yes. supply goes up like that, that prices are going to tank. We've heard if you have more than a double digit, um, uh, supply, you're probably going to have um, a double digit depreciation, which is what we saw take place. Right. So from all of a sudden, market corrects, right? The market yep. corrects and goes, whoa, 
we've got way too much inventory here. Now we got to get rid of the inventory. And guess what? To get rid of 13 months supply of inventory, that's what happened with the pricing down there. So then let's move forward and go, when, you're, when your customers, and depending on if you're talking to a buyer or a seller, it's a different conversation, but let's just deal with a buyer conversation of what should I do? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I look at this and I go, you know, it's hard, it's hard to um, encourage a buyer um, to pay anything over asking price. I mean, it just doesn't make a lot of sense in reality and normally. Um, but here we are. And um, if you want to buy a home today, you are going to have to be aggressive. The question is, can the people afford it? Well, the beautiful part that's still with us today is the low interest rates. And people's affordability is able to, to handle this. And so at some point, we will hit the point where the public is not able to afford the payment on the average sales price. I don't know what that is right now, um, but I do know that if interest rates go up, it will slow this down. And um, in the meantime, you know, the, the builders are ramping up, um, investors are buying heavily into the, the residential market still because they see it as a good investment. So homeowners, are, um, families are competing with investors for homes right now. Um, so I got to sneeze here, Paul. So no take problem. So I'm going to, I'm going to, while you're, while you're, while you're sneezing, um, I'm going to bring it real quickly back to the, the bubble again, because the question is, are we in a bubble today? And a lot of the experts we've heard Dave Ramsey has opinions on it. We've seen economists have opinions on it. NAR just released an opinion on it recently. And most of the economists do not believe it's an actual bubble like we experienced in 2008 because of the fundamentals of what's happening are different because this is supply and demand driven versus a speculation driven uh, bubble, which, which was what we had in 2008. Um, so what they're, what they're saying is, so what happens after? Let, let's imagine, that, let's imagine that, that things settle down, um, things start to level off, what's gonna happen a lot. And, and I'm just gonna tell you what, what we're reading and what we're seeing is a lot of economists are believing that what's going to happen is that the prices are not going to drop. They're not going to tank. You're not going to see a huge price loss. What you're going to see is you're going to see, you're going to see a reduction in multiple offers. You're going to see inventory start to build slowly. And then what you're going to see is you're going to see pricing that's been going like this. It's going to go more like this. Versus sideways. a pop. Versus a pop. It's not a, they're, so, they're thinking it's going to be a, a sideways movement versus like what we experienced in 2000. What we experienced in 2008 was almost a free fall of pricing. I mean, oh, you couldn't really? you you couldn't get price reductions out fast enough. We, we basically, Greg, remember we would sit down with, with sellers. We would sign about three to four price adjustments right. at one time. We'd have every single $10,000 price adjustment pre-signed. Right. And we, 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 you know, you had to keep up with the market as it was just dropping. So the economists are basically saying they don't think that's where we're at. They think we're just going to see prices leveling off. We're going to see maybe 1%, 2%, 3% increase in pricing versus 12, you know, double digit percent increases year over year. So now you want to talk about how do you talk about this with, with the uh, public? Well, I was talking first about with buyers. And so we just kind of um, gone through this. And, and, and again, ultimately, you have to be able to say to all these people, look at, I don't have the crystal ball. Right. You always have to cover. Yourself. Right. You, you have to we have, have a, we have this information from these smart people over here, but we don't know. I mean, that that's just their best. Right. Analysis. Yeah. So I want to make sure that that the agents we're using nuance, and the agents need to use nuance in that conversation. And when you're talking with a seller, it's like, you know, it's like, look at if you, um, it, it you know, it's like, well, if if Number one, if you think it's a bubble, you probably ought to sell now, right? Mm -hmm. And if you're unsure, um, I guess then you know you got to go into a different discussion. Of well, early today, early with that question right there, should I wait? Um, that we Dave, someone we, you and I were listening to that podcast with Dave Ramsey just today, and the question was from this guy. He said, "Hey, um, we own a home right now. We want to move into a a a new a, a move up home. We, we want to move into a different school district. This kind of stuff." Should we sell now, 
take our money off the table and then wait the market out and then rebuy later. And uh, Dave Ramsey's advice was, nope, you should sell now and buy now because if you sell now and you pull it off the table, you are going to be losing value every single year until you buy. Because you, 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 do you see what I'm saying there? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is, and, and I can, I'm sure there are people right now, there are sellers that have been sitting on the sidelines and they've been thinking for the last five years that they were going to wait for the right moment and it, and it hasn't happened. And the question is, how long do they continue to wait? And if the question really becomes, can you sell your house for a lot of money today? Yes. And it, I mean, that's a great thing. The hard part again is going to be the, how are you going to find something on the other side, which we had that discussion a couple of weeks ago, and you've got more paperwork on that, Paul, that you're going to be putting out regarding the suitable. Yeah, we got it finalized. It was a little bit more, uh, it was a little tricky to get us all on the same page of, of the way to do it, but we're going to get it out. All right. And so um, we believe that there is no reason uh, at this moment that anybody can out guess this market. Um, and I think if we take the fear out of it, well, if, if you can afford the payments um, it, you know, at the interest rate that you're at, and again, everybody can afford a whole lot more house at 3% interest rates than they can at six or eight or 10. And um, so there's an opportunity right now, if you're a seller, I mean, if you wait, and the market drops and now it's a different market, there's more homes on the market. Well, guess what? You're gonna end up with a higher rate and you may end up with a higher interest rate and, um, and everything's negated that you thought you were gaining. So um, it doesn't seem to make sense for a seller to sit on the sidelines, mainly because they're thinking about the next home. They're, they're, they love the idea where their, their home to sell is at, but they're worried about the other side. But I'm looking at it and going, if I were going to make a move right now and I were going to be getting a mortgage, I think that I'd want to try to make it happen now while I knew I had 3% interest rates. Right. Right. And the other thing that we haven't talked about and, you know, is the inflation um, factor, which um, that discussion is more and more on the table. And I can tell everyone that typically, traditionally, when you get higher inflation, they typically use interest rate increases to slow down inflation. So for those of, for those of you watching right now and you're, you, you know, cause I know that not everybody watches every single live stream, every single episode. We wish that you would, we understand that you probably have your own stuff going on, but we, we, we interviewed Paul Isley from Grand Valley um, a few months ago and asked him why in the world do we have such a shortage of housing? And one of the largest reasons, especially in Michigan, is we have a huge amount of millennials and Gen Z buyers. So millennials and Gen Z are a huge generation and they're here, there's jobs, the economy is good. So they're buying houses and um, they're eating up a lot of the houses. So, so that's what, one reason why we have this pinch of available inventory is there's just a lot of people who entered the marketplace who never owned a home before and they're just eating up available homes. Yep. And when we came out of the crash, we heard that millennials and, uh, you know, were not going to be buying uh, homes. They were going to they be, lived, they lived with mom and dad for years. Right. So right. what we have is we have, we have, we have a lot of things correcting a lot of people coming out of their parents' homes. A lot of people uh, graduating college with the jobs available and they're able to buy, Yeah. you know, um, you know, and so um, hopefully you guys learned something today. Um, we, we can share, what we'll do is we'll share some links with this live stream here. So you guys can educate yourself and read from the professionals on a bubble on what it is. And if we are in a bubble or if we're not in a bubble, um, it is our opinion that this is not a bubble. It's definitely heated. We're definitely seeing, um, unprecedented value gains, but the fundamentals are different from what we're reading, from what we're seeing, from what we're hearing. It's not the speculative, um, uh, gambling betting that we saw in 2008. If anybody is speculating right now, it would be the investor set. Mm -hmm. But for the homeowners, if, if they're buying and they're paying 20, 30, 40,000 dollars over the asking and they're getting 3% interest rates, they can afford those payments. Mm -hmm. And so what was so different back in the um, 
the 08 range, when these people were paying these ridiculous prices, the amazing part was they couldn't afford the payments. They were taking the risk that they were somehow going to be able to unload that quickly and make a few bucks. And they got caught. Yeah. And it started yeah. the tumbling effect. And people had extended. Banks gave people with bad credit um, credit, which they shouldn't have given them. People were financing more than they should have. Um, and today, I believe that even though the prices seem somewhat crazy, um, the payments that people are making at 3% is reasonable based upon their incomes. I think there's still room to, to grow in West Michigan. The average price in the US, I think as of uh, a month ago was $350,000. And we know right now that we have markets yet, whether it's, uh, I, I, I mean, there's, there's individual associations that have sales prices average that are still below 200,000. And there's some that are in the middle. And then probably the high is Grand Rapids up there around just under 300 now. Mm -hmm. And um, so I believe we live in a very affordable area, an affordable market as long, and the caveat is as long as these interest rates are down around three, this continues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think anyone is really predicting an, any sort of a, a immediate end to this. Maybe they're, I think they're, they're maybe predicting it just to begin slowing, slowing like a soft slowdown, but we're not, we're not, we're not the economists. We're just reading about it. So like I said, guys, we will post um, those links below so you guys can educate yourselves, learn to have these conversations. You don't have to be economist. You don't have a crystal ball, but it is, it is good to understand what's going on because a lot of the, a lot of things you'll hear in the marketplace, you'll see people posting memes. You'll see people posting things about how insane the real estate market is, right? And it's good for us to have a basic understanding of what's going on and why and some of the mechanics of what's happening out there. So hopefully you guys learned something. Um, Greg, do you want to add anything or should we say well, farewell? You know, again, our goal, ultimate goal here was that the agents would not be afraid and not step aside and avoid these conversations. And you're going to need to have this with some of your clientele. Mm -hmm. They're thinking about it. They're wondering, they're worrying, they might be having some fear. And so you need to discover this. You need to pull it out. You need to have the conversation and you need to do it in a way where you're not speaking as an authoritarian. Uh, you're not speaking as though you've got it figured out and nobody else does. You have to be uh, humble in this conversation, but you can talk about these areas and then it's ultimately up to them and by the way, that brings me to the, uh, a week ago, I was going to talk about, um, uh, you know, when you are advising or counseling somebody, a buyer on how to uh, make an offer. And I think many agents are, not many, but some agents are finding themselves in a position where they're, the client is asking them to select the number to offer. And you want to avoid that like the plague. You want to have a discussion that basically you need to figure out how to have the buyer pick that number because whoever says the number owns it. And if they lose, then it's, it comes back to you. Um, if it's their number, they've got nobody to blame but themselves. So it's your job to circle the wagons on all the different scenarios and building ranges that they could offer in. But ultimately, the number that goes down in that buy sell should be the number that they have selected, not that you have selected for them. So, All right. All right. Well, thank you so much for tuning let's, in. Let's Sorry we couldn't go up. live. Go ahead, Greg. I just said, let's hope it warms up. Yeah, I think we're going to get there next week. All, All right, right, everybody. Uh, have a great rest of your day. Uh, thanks for tuning in. We'll get the kinks worked out next time and we'll go live. Appreciate it, everybody. All Take right. care.